and the cow have much in them. Both have backbones, and both are warm-blooded mammals. But they are strikingly different in the manner in which they digest their food. The cow does not itself digest the food it consumes. The food goes first to a very large sack, the rumen, containing billions of microorganisms which include both bacteria and protozoa. These microorganisms can digest cellulose and other materials in grass and hay that cannot be digested by the cow or by man. This microbial method of digestion is shared by the entire group of animals called ruminants. The ruminants include such animals as sheep, bison, impala, and camels. This ability to use the cellulose in fibrous materials sets the ruminants apart from man and explains their great success as grazing animals. Ruminants, when they graze, consume food rapidly. It is later regurgitated and chewed again more completely. This is commonly called chewing the cud, but the scientific term is rumination. The microorganisms in the rumen include both protozoa and bacteria. Some species of both are able to utilize the cellulose in the fibrous materials. Many of the protozoa have adapted so completely to a life within the rumen that they are found only in the rumen. Let us examine them to see their kinds and characteristics. To do this, it is necessary to obtain rumen contents and place them under a microscope. For such studies, it is useful to have a hole or fistula opening into the rumen. This animal has such a fistula from which rumen contents can be removed, located on its left side. In this case, the opening is large enough to permit an instrument which one might call a sample grabber to be inserted to obtain a sample of the solid materials. The grabber is closed, the sample brought out, and dumped into a beaker. Another sample can then be taken until the required quantity has been obtained. Note the consistency of the rumen contents. A mixture of hay or grass which is undergoing digestion and liquid both water which has been drunk and saliva which has been secreted. If one takes some of this material and allows it to settle in a flask, then takes material from the bottom and places it under the microscope. This is what he sees, myriads of ciliate protozoa of many sorts and sizes in active motion. Here some of the ciliates have ceased moving and have settled to the bottom, but many are still active. Usually the rumen contains more solid material or food than is evident here. Here are lumen contents shortly after removal from the cow's stomach. The tremendous activity of the protozoa closely approximates what happens in the rumen. In an actual preparation of whole rumen contents, there would be a video more plant material than is evident here. In this high power microscopic view, one can see the very small bacteria which are also very abundant in rumen contents. These protozoa can live only within the rumen of cattle and other related animals. They obtain their food in the form of starches, sugar, cellulose, bacteria, and other materials. They are classified according to the location of the cilia. Some of the protozoa are known as holotreaks. They move by means of cilia which are evenly distributed over the body. They resemble some of the common free-living protozoa, such as paramecia. Most of the organisms shown here are species known as isotreca intestinalis. One distinguishing characteristic is the mouth on one side of the animal, a little back from the middle. The clear spot you see in each organism is the nucleus. This is an enlarged view of Isotreca intestinalis. The motion of the bacteria at the surface of the animal shows clearly the way in which the cilia operate. Note the tendency for bacteria to accumulate in the vicinity of the mouth. You can also see a few individuals of another species of Isotreca. They have the nucleus at the posterior end. This protozoan, Isotreca prostoma, should have been called poststoma, or mouth at the back. Apparently, when it was first described, the direction in which this protozoan moved was not known. This is Isotreca prostoma enlarged. Another of the holocreeks is also shown here. It is the very small, almost transparent animal you can see occasionally. It is a dazitreak. Here the dazitreaks have been separated from the rest of the rumen contents. Notice the cilia covering the entire surface. The scientific name of these small organisms is dazitreca ruminantium. 
The black spot in the back of the animal is a contractile vacuole. The nucleus is also toward the back, but is not easily visible here. The basitrics are often more abundant than the isotrics. Together, they play an important part in the nutrition of the animal. These conjugating basitrics are mutually exchanging nuclear material. This sporadic occurrence involving many individuals simultaneously is followed by division of both organisms. Some of these dazitrics appear to be rather light in color and are not as active as the dark ones. This is because of the quantity of food each has consumed. The dazitrics, as well as the isotrics, utilize sugar to form reserve starch, the dark material inside the animal. The large organisms here are isotrechs, and the small active round balls are dazitrechs. Both have stored tremendous quantities of dark starch and are very active. In the background are less active entodynia and diplodynia. These belong to another group of rumen protozoa, which are unable to use soluble sugars in the feed. Thus, they are transparent since they have not stored any food. Oddly enough, holotrechs seem to be unable to control the quantity of sugar which they consume. If too much is available, they store starch until they burst. Most of these protozoa are of the genus Endodinium, which has cilia only around the mouth. Dinium means whirl of cilia. Endodinia are unable to store any starch from external sugar. Instead, they consume the starch in the feed, take it into their bodies, and digest it to sugar, which is then converted to their own starch. These endodynia have been fed a little bit of ground wheat. The bright white particles are starch grains. Note how the endodynia have become dark by taking in these starch grains and by beginning to store their own reserve starch. Notice also how much more active and ball-shaped they are in the presence of this abundant food. Endodynia become extremely numerous in animals that are fed grain. This is endodynium caudatum. Caudatum means tail. Watch the action of the cilia around the mouth. This is the biggest species of entodinium, entodinium bursa. Notice that it moves by means of the one group of cilia around the mouth. Here you can see the starch grains that have been taken in by this entodinium. Diplodinium, this organism, has two groups of cilia. The dorsal cilia at the lower left form one band, the oral cilia another. This diplodinium is just beginning to divide. You can see new cilia forming in the middle. Another species is called diplodinium rostratum. Notice the little group of cilia on the dorsal side. Diplodinium gracile often ingests large quantities of starch. This specimen is exploring plant particles, some of which it may take into its body. Many of the diplodinia can digest the cellulose, hemicellulose, and other materials in these plant particles. Note the two lines in the body of this diplodinium gracile. They mark the two sides of a skeletal plate, common in many species of diplodinium. In this enlarged view of a sluggish diplodinium gracile, note again the cilia around the mouth and on the dorsal side of the animal. The anal opening is in the indentation between the scissor-like posterior lobes. Undigested residues of plant material are extruded at that point. This diplodinium gracile contains very little food and appears somewhat transparent. You can see the skeletal plate. The openings along the dorsal side are the contractile vacuoles. This specimen has consumed more food. This species, known as Diplodinium neglectum, is a very common type. It has one narrow skeletal plate. It usually does not have any posterior extension or spine. This is Diplodinium neglectum at a greater magnification. In the background here, one can again see the bacteria. This large diplodinium is so well filled with food that one cannot see the internal structure. Note the manner in which bacteria and plant particles are brought toward the mouth. This specimen, Diplodinium multivesiculatum, has been feeding upon starch and is packed with starch grains. The motion of the bacteria shows well how the cilia create circles of motion leading to the mouth. This is a diplodinium 
called a vesiculatum, which has consumed another protozoan or small insect, but it finds that it cannot hold it and lets it go. The largest of all the diplodinia is diplodinium medium. This individual has also taken in another protozoan. Note the little blister on the upper side of this animal, showing that it is almost dead. Epidinium is another interesting Roman ciliate. It is conical and somewhat tapered toward the back end. The dorsal cilia are clearly visible at one side. This is Epidinium ecaudatum, variety caudatum. Note the single spine at the posterior end. This is Epidinium ecaudatum, variety catanei, with five spines. You can see the bright granules of starch grains upon which this organism feeds avidly. This epidinium catanei has not fed as much and therefore shows the cell structure more clearly. Note the myriads of bacteria in the background. It is probable that most Roman protozoa use the bacteria as food on which to grow and obtain their energy from sugar, starch, or cellulose. Epidinium can become extremely abundant in animals that are feeding upon red clover. Ophryoscolex percinii is another of the Roman protozoa. Ophryoscolex avidly ingests starch grains. Occasionally, it consumes the green material of plants, the chlorophyll. It also eats bacteria to obtain the building materials for growth. The dorsal cilia, instead of being near the mouth, are located almost a third of the way back on the body of the animal. Ophryoscolex possesses a forked skeletal plate. This specimen shows the dorsal cilia around the mouth and also the clear spots where the contractile vacuoles are located. Ophryoscolex is the most complex of all the rumen protozoa. In fact, the most complex of all known ciliate protozoa. These myriads of rumen protozoa and bacteria supply the energy and building materials needed by the host. The relationship between the protozoa and the host was first established millions of years ago. Since that time, the habitats within which the protozoa can grow have become limited to the rumen of cattle and related animals. Consequently, these protozoa are found nowhere else. Obviously, some mechanism whereby the protozoa can be transmitted from the mother to offspring is necessary in order that they be retained within the species. This is accomplished by the licking or grooming of the newborn calf by the mother. The calf, in turn, licks itself and its mother. In the process of rumination, the protozoa and bacteria are brought up into the mother's mouth so that they are also left on the calf's coat or on the grass. Thus, the calf obtains its stock of protozoa from the mother. <laughs>